Um, this is one of a continuing series of programs put on by the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology and hosted at the Fleet Science Center. The topic for tonight's Exploring Ethics Forum has to do with two areas which we have put together. So as we go through tonight's program, I'm hoping that people will keep them both distinct and recognize their two areas, but also see in, see in what ways those two areas link to one another. One is the question of research misconduct in science. How do we decide what is acceptable in science, what isn't acceptable, what are the kinds of things that scientists might do that are unacceptable? And the second question, which links to the second topic, is, is the question of climate change, the large body of climate change research that is going on worldwide, and what does the possibility of research misconduct in light of the emails that were recently revealed, um, what does that suggest about the nature of climate change research, if anything, and how do we, how do we link those, those issues together? So in order to present tonight's program, we have um, two parts, then, of the presentations. The first part will be uh, from me, because this happens to be an area that I work a lot on, and that's thinking about responsible conduct of research, when scientists um, compromise the best standards, what that means, how frequently it occurs. So I'm going to say some things about that, specifically using those climate change emails as a jumping off point. And then after I've completed, we have two scientists um, who um, broadly might be considered climate change researchers, although I know at least one of them prefers to be considered a geochemist, um, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography here in San Diego. And they will be able, they will help a great deal in, in keeping us clear on the science. Now my guess from what I've heard from many conversations is that we will have some people in the audience tonight who might have some views on this topic. Um, our goal here is to have a thoughtful conversation, to hear from one another, and to not start with presumptions that any of us have all of the answers, but to try and sort through the issues. Another interesting observation on the fact that most of us have views is that, as it turns out, most of us are not climate change researchers and are not ourselves experts on the topic. So that's, a good, that's one important reason why it's valuable that we have some people tonight who can help us sort through some of those questions. What I want to do now is get some of these, my slides set up here. Um, I have just a few slides which I will go through. We uh, will have, have uh, three presentations, including mine, which hopefully will take on the order of a half hour. And after that, we will then have open discussions. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to ask questions and talk with us. Although from past experience, it may still not be enough. Uh, but if you want to talk a little bit further after the program, to the extent that we're all available, you're welcome to join us for that conversation. So this is the first of three examples of the emails that were discovered um, after somebody apparently hacked into the server that had emails from the Climate Change Research Unit um, in East Ang at East Anglia University. So this email, uh, depending on your viewpoint, could say one of two things. And I, I'll just read it to everybody on the same page. Somebody wrote to someone else, and don't leave stuff lying around on FTP sites. You never know who is trawling them. The two MMs have been after the CRU station data for years. If they ever hear there's a Freedom of Information Act now in the UK, I think that I'll delete the file rather than send to anyone. So looking at this email, I thought, what would somebody who is absolutely sure that climate change, um, the argument that climate change is occurring and the planet is warming, what would somebody who believed that is a hoax see in this email? And what they would see in this email is with absolute confidence that these scientists are undoubtedly trying to hide information they have data that tells us what's really going on, and they're trying to hide it. Conversely, if somebody was absolutely convinced that climate change research was on the right track, and in fact the planet is warming because of accumulation of carbon dioxide, among other issues, then they might look at this email and say, these people are under siege. They are recognizing that there are people who are going to try and distort anything they have in the record, and it's better to only wait to publish what they want to publish rather than to leave open everything they're working on. So at this point, we have an, you know, the, the scholarly scientific way to look at this is we have a question about what this, what this memo actually means, what was actually being done. The second example is the other paper by MM, a, a scientist, is just garbage. 
I can't see either of these papers being in the next IPCC report. Kevin and I will keep them out somehow, keep them out of this report, even if we have to redefine what the peer review literature is. Now again, if you believe that climate change is basically a hoax, you would look at this and say, this is clear evidence that these people are trying to suppress good science by other scientists. And if you believe that climate change research was appropriately described by, by the numerous scientists working in that field, you would look at this and say, these people are concerned that there is, there is work that basically is garbage. And the idea we get through the peer review system is almost unconscionable. And they can't believe that that would be the case. So their sense would be there's something wrong with the peer review system. Those two views require further investigation to know what the actual answer is. And finally, misrepresentation. Um, I've just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps or temperatures to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards, and from 1961 for Keats to hide the decline. Now, as somebody who studies research misconduct, I can look at this and easily imagine somebody who's concerned that this research, this line of research is basically a large, massive hoax a conspiracy among scientists to say that something's occurring that isn't, they would look at that and say, here's the proof. These people are talking about faking something to make it look like something's occurred that hasn't occurred. Conversely, those people who are working in the field and those people who are um, more open to climate change research would look at this and say, that word trick is a tricky word. And I, I looked at that word and realized that in my own research as a scientist, we often use that word not to mean that I am trying to fake something, but it's, it's a method. This is an approach that I've taken to try and show something or do something that I'm trying to accomplish. And when it says adding in the real temps, at first it looks like there's some sort of a weird addition. But if you look at the figures apparently that are involved, my understanding is that what's actually being done is both the data that are surrogate data for temperatures and the actual data for temperatures are being shown at the same time, thus making it clearer for somebody to see both what's, what's going on in terms of those two kinds of measures. So this misrepresentation is something that will go in this category that is often called research misconduct. Those of you who um, have the good fortune of not working in the scientific community these days, because there's some, a lot of things we have to deal with, may not know about the definition of research misconduct, but it is actually now federally determined. There's a definition of what is research misconduct. It's fairly narrowly defined by three things. Fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. If you are an institution funded by the federal government, if you do any of these three things, it's wrong. Now, that is not terribly surprising to most people, because basically fabrication means that you make it up without doing the work, so that means you lied. Falsification means you did the work and you decided to fix it to make it look better than it really is. That means you're cheating. And plagiarism means that you are taking the words, writings, or ideas of someone else, taking credit for them for yourself. That means that you're stealing something. So all of us know that you're not supposed to lie, cheat, or steal. And as it turns out, there are cases of scientists who have done each of these things. What you could then ask is, is that the only kind of misconduct? And, and obviously, there's a range of behaviors that human beings can go through. At one extreme is this research misconduct I've just defined. But there are a range of other possible behaviors that could be problematic for the research record. There could be ways in which people are arrogant or sloppy or ignorant of things they should know that could all disrupt or corrupt the research record. And along the range of these two hostile behaviors, you can imagine there's also a slippery slope where some people might choose to do this today, and they'll do more tomorrow, and by the end of the week, they'll be shooting their neighbor to borrow their lawnmower. So there is a range of possible things that people could do, and it isn't surprising to expect that this might occur in science. If it does occur, it would be very fair for you to ask, across science, how often does this occur? The best study that's been done of this so far, in terms of what we know, showed that based on the findings of research misconduct nationwide, the rate of research misconduct, the rate of lying, cheating, and stealing in science, is 1 in 100,000 scientists per year. Those of you who are thinking that's too high, I agree it's too high, but it is considerably lower than the rate of lying, cheating, and stealing by members of the US Congress, or for that matter, <laughs> by members of the medical profession. Now, having said that, it isn't all of the cases of research misconduct.
common. There are cases that aren't found, and other studies suggest it's more frequent, but it apparently is not so frequent that the body of scientific knowledge has managed to continue to advance, and we now have, for example, all of the, all of the discoveries and, and breakthroughs that have made it possible for people to live much longer now, by far, than they did 100 years ago, when the life expectancy was less than 50 years of age. And for those of us in the room, looking around the room, there are a few of you along with me who get chances are you would have been dead had you been born in that period of time. Third thing, and the three points I want to make, five points I want to make in this last slide, is that um, an allegation is not proof. We all know this from our lives, where somebody accuses us of something and we know it's not true. Just because somebody accuses you does not mean that you're, you're guilty of that. In the case of those emails I just cited, we cannot resolve tonight how bad or how serious the misconduct was, if any, on the part of the scientists accused in this case. There is an investigation going on now at East Anglia University, and we have to wait until that investigation has gone through the body of data to figure out what had actually happened there. So our discussion tonight will have to focus more on the question of what if, in the worst case, that research misconduct had actually occurred in the case of some of these climate change researchers. Fourth, um, this is a lesson that we can take separately from this. I, how many of you do not use email? It's right in the room. Just, just, I thought it would be a small number. Okay, a couple of you don't. The rest of you who do know that you probably don't want your email messages read by anyone other than the person you send them to. And probably you want them not even read sometimes by that person either. <laughs> so if somebody were to take emails out of context, you could potentially find almost anything. The amount of material that has been reported publicly that looks bad for these researchers is equivalent to a small fraction of what I write in a single day. So when you think about how many researchers were involved in this, in this breach of, of security, it isn't and wouldn't be surprising that there wouldn't be shorthand and things said in those emails that might look bad. So in some senses, you might wonder why there wasn't more found. Now that doesn't mean there isn't anything wrong here, but it does mean that we should think about what it means when we have something taken out of a context that was not supposed to be public. And finally, we shouldn't forget that scientists are human. I am not up here to suggest to anybody that there are no scientists who will commit misconduct, who will lie, cheat, or steal. In fact, I know firsthand of examples of people who have done that. But the nature of the science profession tends to be one where that's not as likely as in other professions. Now, for the sake of making sure we have a body of time that where we can spend time discussing these issues with you as much as possible, I only want to take any questions if there's something that somebody needs a clarification on from what I've covered so we can move on with our two guests tonight. Let's see, if there's any hands up, I can't see a two of the light. Yes, okay, yes. In the email that was up before, it said the, uh, the research from MM is garbage. Who's MM? Um, I don't remember the name of MM. Do, I, do you, either of you guys know who that would be? Well, it's, well, it's known. I just don't know what Do either of you know? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. That's something that we could, I, I suspect you could find on Wikipedia. Yeah, or some other similar <laughs> reputable source. Um, one, one last question. Uh, Mike's trick that's referred to in the email, isn't that a reference to the hockey stick graph? Uh, all the, the newspaper articles I've read suggest that it is. Um, I'm going to defer to, do either of you have an answer to that? I, I, my understanding was it was simply a matter of, being, of showing both real temperature data at the same time along with surrogate measures that were not seen, deemed to be as accurate in recent times. I think I can answer it. Right. So actually, maybe this is a good segue. So um, the first of our two speakers is Ralph Keeling from Scripps Institute of, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. You have bios for both of our speakers. Ralph um, does a tremendous amount of work on CO2 and other species of gas in the atmosphere and how they're changing on the planet. So, so thank you, Mike. Uh, to, to the question about the trick and Michael Mann's hockey stick, I think, I think it was really almost answered here already. My understanding is that it refers to the fact that the tree ring temperature record does not agree with the 
observed temperature record for some part of the latter 20th, 20th century, the suspicion is that it might have to be to do with something like the fact that carbon dioxide is rising over that time, and that's interfering with the signal, pure signal of temperature in the tree rings. And so if you plot them both, you see the, them diverging at the end, but we know the real temperatures, so we know the tree rings are wrong over that period. So the trick isn't really a very clever trick, it's just not showing the tree ring data over the latter part of the record where we know it isn't right. Okay, so I'm going to move on here. I'm going to <coughs> tell a little story that includes a narrative about the career of my father, Charles D. Keeling, and my own career. Uh, to go through just a little bit of how these, or my career and his career developed. And this is done not so much out of self-indulgence, but because I think it, at least his is a good story, and there are some general points that bear on the subject at hand. Um, so he uh, got interested in carbon dioxide measurements after he took a post postdoc position at Eric, and he was... Hello? Uh, uh, he was uh, interested in. This is cutting out. It sounds okay here. No? Okay. Um, he, he was interested, among other things, in having uh, a time to experience the wonderful outdoors of the West. He'd grown up in uh, Illinois and, and had been out to the West as a child. And, uh, he got initially placed in a project at Caltech involving crushing rocks in a basement. He looked around for another project, and uh, he was given the idea of looking at uh, carbon in river water. So he got, that allowed him to drive around and sample river waters in California. And he was interested in just the fundamentals of what controls the level of carbon dioxide and other carbon species in river water. As an offshoot of that, he needed to know the carbon dioxide concentration in the air because the rivers are exposed to the air, it's part of the influence. And uh, he, for whatever reason, developed a new method of measuring carbon dioxide in the air that was considerably more precise than prior measurements and more accurate, uh, and discovered that there was a regularity to the fluctuations in the atmosphere in a forest, say, that hadn't been noted before, the levels were higher at night and lower in the day, but the most interesting thing was that the daytime values were almost the same no matter where he looked. They were always around 315 parts per million. And he surmised from that that there must be some kind of stable background that was influencing these. So he then, he, then he left the rivers behind and went to look at carbon dioxide concentrations and clean sites near the coastline, away from forests. He went up on mountaintops, and lo and behold, he, stepped, killed, he, he continued to get almost the same concentration. Now, prior measurements, there were those, a wide body of prior work on carbon dioxide that suggested that the atmosphere was highly variable. Uh, and uh, fluctuations by 50 or more parts per million. And he realized that something had been missed. And that these prior measurements somehow hadn't captured this existence of a stable background in the atmosphere. The prior measurements, he surmised, and it was pretty clear to show that this was reasonable were either compromised by the methods being flawed or the, the investigators had not taken care to get away from local influences like forests or trees and, and towns and so forth. So recognizing that there was a stable background, he was very interested in studying whether this background itself might change. And this was a time when there was great interest in whether carbon dioxide was rising because the concerns about CO2 rising and global warming were already on the research agenda in, this, in the late 1950s. Barely, but they had just moved on there in part by a, a paper written by Roger Revelle and his colleague Hans Seuss, both from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So he then went with, took a position at Scripps. This was the method he used involved taking samples in glass flasks, uh, freezing the CO2 out with liquid nitrogen, measuring the, accurately the amount of carbon dioxide that had been frozen out with the simply measuring the pressure and temperature in a known volume using the, essentially the ideal gas law, and he could get a precise record. He also engaged in the use of an infrared <coughs> instrument, which allowed precise measurements to be made more easily, and set up a station on Mauna Loa to try to track this background. Why Mauna Loa, Hawaii? Well, it was about as far away as you could get from a city or a tree. Right smack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, what better place to look? And there was already a program to build a station out there. So this is the Model Observatory, and 
The record came in in a matter of months. It was clear there was some small fluctuations within about a year or so. It was clear there was a seasonal cycle. And within a couple of years, it was clear there was a rising trend. And this is what the data looked like in around uh, the early 1970s when he published a, a paper showing a record that was noticed by a lot of people. And that's, of course, what's happened in the meantime. So it, it just keeps on going up. The ability to track this and the methods that he worked out are now being emulated by lots of people. You can do this at different stations. In fact, there's a South Pole record. This is showing the Mauna Loa record in the middle here, along with several other records. Uh, th these are all data from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. The, the one at the very bottom with the small wiggles is from the South Pole. They've all been offset so that uh, they can be shown, but they're all basically tracking almost together. Now, you would say, okay, it's easy to measure carbon dioxide once you know how to do this. Why do it in so many places? Well, the answer is that there are small differences. You can see that the cycle is different in different stations north and south. And new questions arise about what's controlling that cycle related to biospheric activity. There's differences in the mean value related to what the subtle ocean influences. So it opens up a new arena of research into the details of carbon cycling and the controls on atmospheric carbon dioxide. The existence of the background raised the question of what was going on before 1958 and the, after a series of uh, difficult challenges to be overcome, it was possible to measure carbon dioxide in the past through recovering ancient air from Antarctic ice cores. This is the ice core record on a time scale going back 400,000 years. And at the very end, at point zero, that's the present. And then you can see where the Mauna Loa curve fits on that graph. So we're well above the, the background levels. And, and you can also see that there was a period uh, of about 10,000 years the re most recent 10,000 years where the levels were around 280 parts per million. So there was a relatively stable 280 and then it's been going up since then. There's been studies to make sure that the ice core records agree. This is an overlap study comparing the, one of the Antarctic cores with the South Pole record uh, and the dots of the, the Antarctic the ice core record and the uh, continuous line is the South Pole record. The agreement isn't perfect. There's small offsets. That's because the ice core record is not as precise. But the agreement is down at the level of a couple parts per million. Very small compared to the changes that have occurred in the past. If you look at the, rec the, the extent of carbon dioxide measurements today, this is a recent slide from the global network of CO2 stations that have registered their programs with the World Meteorological Organization. It's not including everything, but there's a really a dense array of measurements going on in the continents of the U.S. and Europe. There's measurements throughout the Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean. Each one of these stations is producing a curve like the Mount Loa record, rising with time. You can go to the NOAA GMD website and, and see these. There's now hundreds of records that look like that record. Why would anyone bother to do this so many times? Well, the answer is the science has moved on. We're interested in another question. We're interested in understanding these subtle details about the flows of carbon, what's controlling carbon dioxide. There's a possibility that we could even assess emissions from fossil fuel from different countries with this kind of network, um, verifying emissions. There's new applications that arise from that. The science has moved on, but it continues to show that carbon dioxide is rising. So the fundamental ideas in which it were grounded are continually proven with greater and greater solidity over time, even though they're not the reason for, for doing it anymore. The science has moved on. Um, I, I got into this with the idea of adding to this kind of effort by measuring a, another important species in the atmosphere, namely the oxygen concentration. Oxygen is consumed when you burn fossil fuel, and developing methods and creating records were able to show that the oxygen levels are, are falling in the atmosphere, as you expect from fossil fuel burning. Um, we interpret this data with knowledge that fossil fuel is burning, and they were able to use it to say things about other influences on oxygen, like whether the land plants are growing or not. But you could step, step back and say, well, this actually, is in a sense, proves that the rise is due to fossil fuel burning. It offers support for that, because otherwise, we couldn't explain what was going on in oxygen. We didn't do that to test that, because it was already accepted science. But it does offer additional proof. So it's another example of how, when the science moves on, it actually continues to ground the fundamentals even more solidly. So, thank you. Any points of clarification before we go to our next speaker? Can you go back to the uh, 400,000 year ago slide? 
This one. Yeah. What accounts for the peaks and the big jagged you know, variations? I don't have a pointer, but uh, if people understand what he's talking about, he's talking about these this sawtooth pattern going from 400,000 to about zero before the recent rise. That's what you're talking about? This thing, yeah. this overall sawtooth. This is the glacial interglacial cycle. So these are the, the warm um, interglacial periods, and these are the cold, cold glacial periods. So, excuse me, does that mean that when the temperature changes, it can change the CO2 levels? Or is it the causing the temperature? Yeah, well, this is, this, is, this is, of course, an important question. And, and the important take home message is that the carbon dioxide is fluctuating in concert with temperature. And uh, it appears to be an important factor in, in amplifying the glacial interglacial cycle. So it's an example of a positive feedback where the temperature changes and the CO2 changes and that amplifies the temperature change and that, that helps account for the glacial and glacial cycles. Yeah, but which point starts off the process? Well, we know the process actually starts with the changes in the orbital parameters of the Earth. And, but that doesn't answer the question of what causes the overall shift in temperature because that triggers a change and it's amplified by CO2 by current understanding. That's a lot of change there between 200 that's a 50% move up, a 33% move down. I mean, back at 4,000 years ago, nobody was burning fossil fuels. That's true. Are you questioning, are you, are you questioning that the recent rise is caused by fossil fuel burning? Am I questioning? Yes, I'm questioning it. I don't well, then I ask you, why is the oxygen dropping? And I'd like to know. This is a very important question. You know, which came first here, the chicken or the egg? You know, is, is, is rising temperatures causing rising CO2 levels or vice versa? What causes the, the, the turn? We know that the glacial and interglacial cycles are ultimately caused by changes in the Earth's orbit. We know that they're well, associated with the changes. Earth's orbit been doing lately? <laughs> exactly. So why is carbon dioxide going up now? Well, because we're burning less of fossil fuels. I'm not understanding your point anymore. I'm not understanding your point anymore. That, it must be I, I, that we're, we're burning less of fossil fuels because it's not getting that much colder or hotter. I, I think I've noticed in the last hundred years. I, I think the, the there are, are two issues here that we could extract out. Um, one is the cycles that you've seen in here are, are clearly occurring and they may be due to factors other than fossil fuel burning because fossil fuel burning didn't occur a long time ago. But the second is, and it may not be as easy to recognize in this figure, but what appears to have happened is that with this entire record, if you look at the last time point, which is called zero, that's actually many years because this is a long time scale. And the level of CO2 has gone, in the past it only peaked at around 300 parts per million. And now it's about double that. So there is a dramatic difference. And you could, you could rightly or reasonably ask questions. And maybe we'll come back to that after our next speaker about uh, does, just because we see a correlation between those increased numbers and other measurements of perhaps time and temperature, planet temperatures, does that mean that one is causing the other. We can come back to that perhaps in a bit. Does that uh, seem reasonable? Okay. Thanks. So our thanks for that.